Welcome to Breakthrough Success. I'm your host, Mark Aberti, the content marketing expert, bringing you five new episodes every week where I and top level guests teach you how to take your business to the next level and achieve your breakthrough. Hello, Breakthrough Success listeners. I just wanted you all to know before the episode actually starts, I've been working a little bit behind the scenes to give you something really special. So a while ago, I wrote my book, Content Marketing Secrets, which helps people create, promote, and optimize their content for growth and revenue. And I just put the finishing touches together to offer that for free to anyone who is interested. So if you want your free copy of Content Marketing Secrets, all you have to do is head over to markgaberti.com slash book. Now, let's jump right into the episode. Some of us have really strong messages that we just want to share with the entire world. We want as many people to hear our message as possible. And some of us want to start movements around those messages that result in more business growth, that results in the world being a better place, and just results in human progression. So how exactly do we start a movement around the ideas that we hold so strongly? That's what we're going to talk about in this episode. And who better to do it than today's guest? She is the head of groups and community at Facebook. And she has more than 15 years of experience at successful startups and big brand internet companies, including as a business unit leader at Yahoo and as CEO of the Deal Map which was acquired by Google in 2011. She was most recently president and COO of change.org. She writes about leadership, management, and entrepreneurship for LinkedIn influencers, Fortune, Huffington Post, and other media outlets. Her latest book, Purposeful, teaches people how they can start their own movements and whether they are a manager or a movement starter. Today's guest, for episode 211 of the Breakthrough Success Podcast is none other than Jennifer Dolsky. Jennifer, it is such a pleasure to have you on the show. Mark, it is a pleasure to be here. Episode 211. That's awesome. Jennifer, I'm really looking forward to this interview, and I know you have a lot to share. And uh, before we dive into how we can create our own movements and get people to rally around us. I'm wondering if you could share with us uh, just a little backstory of why you wrote the book Purposeful. Sure. So as you mentioned in my career, I've been fortunate to have a number of positions, many of which have allowed me to have really a front row seat to watching regular people ignite extraordinary change in the world, whether it is entrepreneurs growing their own businesses or, you know, social change organizers who prompt new laws and changes in their communities. And from watching all of these people, I saw that they had many of the same skills. The people who were most successful were doing the same thing, whether they were activists or business people. And I thought if I could just share those tips with more people that more of us would realize this is possible and more of us would be successful in starting our own movement. And I really like that idea of making something that seems so complex, so difficult, more possible for people who uh, they want to start movements or something that they have been subconsciously thinking about. And this whole idea of, hey, you can start a movement around something you're very passionate about is getting people to maybe get some wheels turning. But um, in your experience, based on you writing the book and being involved with change.org and all the other companies, um, how are movements usually started? Yeah, so the really interesting thing is, I think some people get intimidated thinking they have to start with some huge step or you have to be, you know, sort of born Nelson Mandela or Gloria Steinem to become a movement starter. And that really couldn't be further from the truth. And actually, I've I've seen you write about this too, which is the power of small actions. And I sometimes describe movements, starting a movement as being like the first person to stand up in a standing ovation. So I don't know if you've ever done that. Have you have you ever been the first one to stand up and clap? In uh, any definitely kind of show? not. Okay, so it's true. Not not a lot of people have. 
But all it takes is a little bit of courage from one person saying, yeah, I liked that enough that I'm willing to stand up and clap for it. And that's what movements are like. One person, a little bit of courage, something they're passionate about. It can be as small as sending an email to your friends to ask for help or starting a petition, you know, creating an online post or blog. Like these are all things that can tip into movements as you start to rally other people in support around you. And it's really interesting how you mentioned, like, it's usually just like, in some cases, just one person taking a really small step. I mean, when you hear about a movement, usually the way people hear about it, and this again applies to anything like business or to a big change you want in society, you usually see it when it's in the middle. You don't really see the movement as it develops. Uh, So yeah, it's just, just like the small steps, as Jennifer mentioned, that help those movements happen. But one of the key things is to um, rally people around because you can't really have a movement of one. I mean, that's what movements all start as. They all start as movements as one, but they all pick up momentum. They all get supporters. They all get people who care very passionately about it. So how can It's true. Yeah. So the next step, exactly. Like if you consider the movement starter as a spark for the fire, the next few people who come on board are like kindling, right, for the fire. And a good example here, I'll take a business example since that you, a lot of your listeners, I think, are aspiring business people. Uh, There's a, a woman named Allie Webb, who is the founder of Dry Bar, the big national um, salon that does blow dry uh, for people for people's hair. Are you familiar with Dry Bar? Uh, I'm not. I'm going to be very okay, soon. So, yes, that's right. So Allie uh, herself used to be a stylist. She styled people's hair and she had her first child and she was staying home with her child and she wanted to you know, get back into the business. And she actually grew up with super curly hair and she always loved that feeling of having her mom blow dry her hair straight, which made her feel somehow more confident and, you know, prepared to go into the world. And so she said, I'm just going to start doing this for my friends. And she was a stay at home mom, but she would have friends come over or she would sometimes go to their houses. You know, she describes it like she had a bag of brushes with her and a blow dryer. And she just started going to people's houses. And then One person supported her and then a few people and then they told their friends and little by little, she had so much support that she decided to open an actual brick and mortar store in LA called the dry bar. And then when she opened the store, so many people loved it. It was a movement basically for helping women become more confident about themselves and, you know, creating this kind of inexpensive way for them to quickly get a uh, blowout to get their hair straight, um, which sounds like a small thing, but it really isn't because these women were going into the world, you know, vastly more confident on those days. And now Dry Bar has 90 plus locations around the country. They have a line of products at Sephora and other retailers. And it has become this movement that both started small and was kindled by those early people who supported Ally. And again, it's just that theme of, um, a few people coming in and then you grow and uh, then it does become that movement. But in Ali's, Ali's case, it was something she felt passionate about. Uh, it was something that it, like she saw that like she liked the way she felt and she wanted to create that change. She wanted to be the product, be the service uh, that she wanted in the world instead of saying, when is someone going to do this for me? So Uh, If you're thinking about something where, like, why doesn't this exist, you could be the person who makes it exist. That's right. And a lot of the stories that I tell in Purposeful are those why not me stories. So many of them even come out of situations of really difficult personal tragedies, even. There's a story about a man named Hank Hunt who has a really difficult story where he um, he had kind of this picture perfect life. And then he found out one day that his daughter had been tragically murdered by her estranged husband. And this had happened in a hotel bathroom while her kids were sitting in the hotel room on the other side of that wall. And 
those kids tried dialing 911 from the hotel room and they couldn't get through to 911 because it required dialing a nine to get an outside line. And it's such a sad story. And Hank was able to turn that personal story into a really clear vision that other people could get behind, which is a world in which no one has to ever dial an outside line to get 911, where it would be required for all businesses and all organizations to allow straight direct dial. And he actually was able to rally hundreds of thousands of people, more than 600,000 to sign his change.org petition. They were able to successfully persuade Congress to pass a law called Kerry's Law, which now makes it a requirement for businesses to have direct dial to 911. Wow, that, that that is a rough story. I mean, like, uh, like not all the movements are started with like the warm, fuzzy feel. I mean, like in that uh, mm. story, like it is rough. Uh, but Hank said, you know, why not me? As you said, like I'm going to take my tragedy and turn it into hope for other people, so this doesn't happen to anyone else. And rather than just say this is horrible, I'm going to step up and say, why don't I be the person to change it? And I do like, love that theme of um, being the change that you want to see. And there are people who we mentioned that like, they do have like this idea where like um, so, like they want like it to pop up somewhere, but they can be the change. And uh, like not everyone goes through with that, but people like Hank, people like Allie, uh, they're going through. They went through and they made their changes into reality. So. Uh, when we have this movement idea, when we have this big change that we want to see manifest, uh, it's an intention. I'm wondering, how can we transform intention into action? Yeah, so the key thing here is really around clarity of vision. So I think sometimes people forget that you need to take certain steps to make clear what you want to see happen in the world. And it might be something really big, like Hank's was in terms of changing a national law. It might be something small, like maybe your movement is around trying to get certain benefits offered by your employer or getting your school to offer a new course that they don't offer. Either way, whatever your vision or how big or how small, you start by saying, what's my desired future of the world? So what will the world look like if I'm successful? That's step one. Step two is your purpose. Why does it matter to me? So, you know, Hank had a vision of a world where you didn't have to dial direct to get 911 or you didn't have to dial an outside line. And the reason it mattered to him, as we know, was so that it wouldn't happen to another child, what happened to his grandchild. And then the third part is that story. What really brings visions to life is personal story that people can relate to. So there are examples, um, like there's another example in Purposeful about the Boy Scouts of America and people who were trying to persuade the Boy Scouts to accept gay scouts. And instead of making it this general you should accept gay scouts as a movement. It was actually individual people and their stories that ended up being more persuasive, like the story of a young man who had been all the way through the Boy Scouts and then at age 18 was denied his Eagle Scout award because he was gay. Those stories are what really resonate with people. And when you have that clarity of vision, desired future, purpose, and a clear story, that's one thing that helps you turn your intention into action. And like the storytelling, like how you were mentioning that uh, boy in the Boy Scouts with the Eagle badge, like stories like those are easier to visualize and tell the right story you can really um, get people to grasp uh, the movement, grasp the purpose behind it. And I'm wondering what goes into better storytelling for uh, getting more people to realize what it's all about. Right. So this is really key. And I think, you know, oftentimes business people are great at using data. They get a lot of analysis behind their point, which is <laughs> really important and really helpful. But stories still add value in bringing that data to life. And so I tell sometimes a personal example here, which is you know, a lot of um, people have been looking at changing benefits for parents in the workplace. And one of the things that has been, there's been a recent trend around something they call pregnancy parking, 
uh, which is putting sort of closer, larger parking spaces for women who are expecting. And you could say that you could use data and say we have X number of women who are expecting and so forth, and that's why we should have these spaces. But when you use a story, like I have a personal story that when I was pregnant and working at Yahoo back then before pregnancy parking, the spaces were so close together that towards the end of my pregnancy, I literally couldn't get out of my car. I would open the door and it would only open so wide with the car next to me that my body could no longer fit out of the car door. And so you can see how it's the data plus the actual story that makes that more compelling. And sometimes what people think can be hard about storytelling is the vulnerability. Like you do have to be willing to be a little bit vulnerable to share a story, even like the one I just told, right? I'm kind mm -hmm. of describing a story where I was basically so enormous I couldn't fit out of my car. Um, but I think what people forget is that with vulnerability comes more support. People are much more willing to rally behind you if you're willing to be vulnerable than if you're not. And we could definitely see this play part in uh, any kind of movement, especially I like, just think about any national movement you see. And uh, if you see vulnerability, that's something that a lot more people are going to support. But um, for someone who, um, like some people, they don't want to show off their vulnerabilities. They want to uh, show off themselves like a high pedestal. So how can we get better at being vulnerable and being able to tell those stories like the one you just told us? Yeah, I mean, generally, I think people see what works and tend to do what works. And what I will say after many years of, you know, leading change.org and now what I see in communities at Facebook is it just works better. You know, everybody relates to each other as human beings. And the more willing you are to be vulnerable, the more people will get behind you. And so I think you could try not doing it, but I think people will find once they try it, it's more effective. And it might be that you start with something small where, and I actually had, we have a, um, Facebook group for purposeful in case people want to join a community of people who are in there trying to start movements and support each other. And someone asked this exact question, you know, I'm not quite comfortable yet being vulnerable. And the advice that the community gave to her was start small. You know, don't, you may not want to start with something that's like your deepest inner struggle, but start with something that's a little bit smaller. And that may be a good way to ease into it. Also, if you have some early supporters of your idea, maybe one or more of them have a story to share too. And we've seen this happen. The Boy Scouts is a good example. We've also seen it happen. The Me Too movement is a really good example of this, right? It isn't one person's story. It's everybody's story. And that's why it works. And uh, for basically this entire episode so far, we've been talking about how to build a movement, how uh, to rally more people behind us, how to do the storytelling, basically uh, a few of the steps we need to grow from an idea just that we have to a you know, whole movement. Uh, but to change course a little bit, I'm wondering if you could share with us, what do you believe holds most ideas, most uh, ambitions, most products or services back from becoming movements? I think there's two things here that are critical. One is that people have to have a willingness to ask for help, right? As you point out, like you don't, you can't have a movement as an individual. You have to get supporters, allies, followers, et cetera. And that often doesn't happen unless you ask people to join you. And so there's a good example here of a young entrepreneur who, named Megan Grassel, who went to, she actually took her younger sister, her 13 year old sister bra shopping one day and all they found were these kind of super sexy push-up bras. And she said, this like this is so inappropriate for a 13-year-old. It's just not right. And so she said, you know, I want to create a better product. And she launched this uh, company called Yellowberry, which is a company that makes age-appropriate bras for tween and teen, young teen girls. And, you know, she got it started. She made a prototype, but then she needed help. She needed to raise money in this case to keep it going. And she started a Kickstarter campaign. 
Not a lot of people funded it. And I think a lot of people may have just given up there, said, I tried, you know, nobody funded it. That's, you know, call it a day. But what Megan did is she actually reached out to people she didn't know who she thought might support her idea. She looked at bloggers. She looked at people who led Facebook groups. She looked at journalists. And she sent cold emails or direct messages to 200 people she didn't know, telling them about her idea and asking them for help. And not all of them responded. In fact, most of them didn't. And it turned out, though, it was one particular person who did respond, a woman who ran a blog called A Mighty Girl. She posted about Megan's idea. And the next day, Megan had raised $25,000, which was enough to kick off her business in earnest. And so I think a lot of people get stuck in that first step of just asking for help. And then second thing I think that causes movements to fall down before they're successful is that... A lot of movements have someone or a group of people that they need to persuade to get the decision made about the thing they want to change, whether it's a CEO at a company or an elected official, that oftentimes the thing people want to change is not something they actually have the power to change personally. And there's a chapter in Purposeful about persuading decision makers and really understanding the people we're trying to persuade. The better we understand them, the more we, effective we can be at getting our movements to be successful. And like I'm um, again, like you're bringing in a lot of stories into this episode. You're talking about a lot of case studies, examples, and uh, in some cases, it, it could just be the right person. Uh, coming across your email, coming across your movement at the right time, and all of a sudden it just massively grows. Okay. Uh, so they just keep hustling, obviously, and then uh, if you continue with it, good things can happen. But yeah, uh, one thing you also um, like, I also thought of during that story is that uh, like different story, but like still challenges so like any person trying to create a movement on like raising funds on kickstarter or anything like that or just trying to get people's awareness and getting signatures on change.org it's a challenge to um create a movement it's a challenge to do anything worthwhile and with that in mind jennifer i'm wondering if you could share with us one big challenge you faced in your journey and a powerful lesson you learned during that challenge Sure. So, so many, (laughs) especially as an entrepreneur, when I was running my own company, um, I like to say we failed at least three or four times. We just didn't go home. You know, we literally changed the name of the company three times and the product we built four times. Um, and that was really challenging. I, I describe it sometimes, uh, and there's a post I published recently in Forbes about this, that, it's kind of like climbing a mountain and some days it feels like it's super sunny and you brought a picnic lunch and you could see the top and you know, you're getting to the summit. And then other days it feels like it's a huge storm and you're back at the bottom and you have a heavy backpack and you just aren't sure you could take another step. And what I learned from that experience of, you know, multiple repeated failures is just, how important it is to keep climbing. Like there are going to be days and it's key to remember that there will be cloudy days. And then it's really important to remember that the sunny days will come back again. And I think, you know, I learned the importance of both continuing to climb on the cloudy days when it feels really hard, but also continuing to climb on the sunny days, because sometimes it's really easy to just get distracted and say, yeah, things are going really well. Let's just slow down and have the picnic. Mm -hmm. And that is a time when often, especially as an entrepreneur, someone else can come up from behind you and pass you on that path. So it's really important to just keep going on, on both kinds of days. I really like the uh, mountain metaphor and uh, the uh, cloudy and sunny days. It's just a constant uh, continuation of what you're doing and um it's never really good to stop even if you make very small movement it's better to make some movement uh towards your goal towards your movement uh than no uh movement i was trying to avoid that pun but uh (laughs) no movement at all so um it's 
like I do like the example a lot. Again, it's something very easy to visualize, like being on that mountain and um, like what storytelling, like if you visualize as Jennifer uh, has given us plenty of examples. And with that mountain reference as well, it's easier for you to convey your points uh, to your audience. And uh, one of the other ways that you can attract people to your movements is to learn as much as possible um, about your niche and about some of the things that you can do. And one of my favorite ways of learning new things is to read as many books as possible. So with that in mind, Jennifer, I'm wondering if you could share with us three great books that you believe will have a positive impact on us. Sure. So my favorite business book is Gung Ho, which is a pretty old book, but um, one that I really love by Ken Blanchard and Sheldon Bowles. This is a story about a Native American folktale and what we can learn about building great teams through things we learn from animals. It actually sounds very bizarre, but it is a short and sweet very pithy book with a lot of great leadership lessons. One of my favorite is called The Gift of the Goose, and it has to do with cheering on your team and shifting the leadership among members of your team. So Gung Ho, favorite business book. Um, I know you're a Seth Godin fan. My favorite Seth Godin book is Free Prize Inside, um, <clears throat> which if people have not read it, it comes in a cereal box. And the reason I love this book is not necessarily because of the creative ideas he poses in the book, but because of how he explains how each of us inside organizations can, um, can be the champion of ideas. It has some similar themes as I write about in Purposeful. And my other favorite business book is called The Rockefeller Habits by Vern Harnish. And this book really talks a lot about the process of leading a team to excellence. And he covers something in the book called the one page strategic plan, which I've used in most of the businesses and teams that I've led. So those would be my three top ones. Jennifer, thank you for sharing with us those great book recommendations. Those will all be in the show notes, marketbirdie.com slash E211. And for anyone interested in a book that can help them create, promote, and optimize their content for growth and revenue, you can grab your free copy of Content Marketing Secrets over at markgaberti.com slash book. And before we wrap up this episode, Jennifer, I've asked you several questions throughout our time together, but what do you believe is one question that we need to be asking ourselves more often? Mm. I'd go with why not me, right? That's the core question behind Purposeful. If you see something that should exist that doesn't, if you see something you want changed, ask yourself, why not me? Jennifer, thank you for sharing with us that great question. All of your great insights throughout our time together. If you guys want to learn more about Jennifer, get her book, Purposeful. Are you a manager or a movement starter? That book will be in the show notes of this episode, markcoverty.com slash E211. Jennifer, I can't thank you enough for sharing all of your great insights with us. It was such a pleasure to have you on Breakthrough Success. Thanks so much for having me. How does over 100 retweets per day sound to you? My free ebook, 27 Ways to Get More Retweets on Twitter, has you covered. I use the methods within this ebook to get over 10,000 retweets every single quarter to learn 